Thank you. Well, it's great to be here in Tokyo. I'm going to be telling you my story. And as you will see, I have a lot of experience with Japan. I love this country, and it's great to be back. But before I tell you my story, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. How's everybody's English? You understand perfectly? Chotto? Chotto? OK. OK, here we go. The world is becoming increasingly unpredictable. So I want you to think about what you were taught in high school, in primary school, even in university. We have been taught to prepare for a world where we can predict things. That's the way we teach. That's the way our education system works. Now, unfortunately, the world is becoming very unpredictable, and especially here in Japan, we've seen how over the last couple of years, a lot of things can change. Now, a lot of things are changing all over the world. We just spent four days in China, two days in Korea, and now we're spending three or four days here in Tokyo. And it is amazing to see how things are changing. I've been to China now about six times over the last four years. And I'll never forget, the first day I went to China about four years ago, I was a little bit scared because I've been coming to Japan for 10 years. But every time I went to China, it started to look a little more similar to Japan. 20 years ago when you went to China, you could see the difference between Japan and China. Things didn't work that well. The service wasn't as good. But now when you're in China and you see that it is becoming like Japan, you worry. Because there's 1.4 billion Chinese. This is more than the United States, Europe, and most developed Asian countries. So we don't know what we can expect over the next 10 years. But we're going to have to prepare for that. Now, as, I, as you just heard, I teach entrepreneurship. I actually teach entrepreneurship in six different courses at IE Business School. IE Business School, like Globus, is very well known for entrepreneurship. We are probably the only business school in the top 10 in the world that forces every MBA student to take six months of entrepreneurship. And many students ask me this question at the beginning of the year. Can anybody be an entrepreneur? What do you think? How many of you think that anybody can be an entrepreneur? Well, hopefully we'll answer that question for you. But it is something you should keep in mind. Mr. Green, money. How important is money to you? Is it your God? Do you know your limits with respect to money? How far are you prepared to go? Many of our students ask themselves that question. And we're going to talk a little more about that. Risk. How much risk are you prepared to take? In my country, in America, people take a lot of risk. Now that I've been living outside America for 20 years, I realize that it's pretty crazy the amount of risk they take there sometimes. Some people with you know, a family and three kids and a house will mortgage their house in order to fund an idea. That's not the European way, and I don't think that's the Asian way either. But every one of us has to come to our own realization as to how much risk we are prepared to take. And that's going to make a big difference in our lives. And finally, passion. Are we passionate about anything in our life? Think about that. Not in your personal life, but in your professional life. Let me ask you a different question. Are you a Friday person or are you a Monday person? 
When Friday comes along, are you like really happy? Thursday night, you're like, oh my God, it's so good. It's only one more day. Or are you a Sunday person? Looking forward to that Monday. Well, for many years, I was a Friday person, but I'm a Monday person now. I love my work. And that makes a big difference. You've got to have a professional passion. Because when you work doing something you enjoy and you're passionate about, it doesn't feel like work. So, let me tell you my story because, you know, you can go to a lot of these conferences and unless you feel something or you experience something, it doesn't sink in. The best way to try to transmit a meaning to you, a feeling, is by telling you a story. And I'm going to do an open kimono here and tell you my story. This is me in 1968. I was eight years old. That's not really a picture of me because there were no cameras in those days. But I probably looked like that. I was an entrepreneur selling lemonade. Did I take a lot of risk here? No. There was no risk. This is my front lawn. Here I am. This is me growing up in Los Angeles, California. And I was sitting in front of my front lawn. And if I didn't sell any lemonade one day, I would just go back into the house. So no risk. Not really an entrepreneur. This is me between 1973 and 1976. I was a paper boy. My wife doesn't like it when I say this in Spain, because in Spain, being a paper boy is not something that you're too proud of. But in America, it is. Because you learn the value of money when you're a paper boy at this age. I was making $50 a month. And every day at 5.30 in the morning, the truck would stop in front of my house, and they would leave stacks of papers. And my mother would get out of bed, wake me up, and say, Paris, it's time to work. And we would put rubber bands around the newspapers, and I would go out into the neighborhood delivering the paper. My father was in bed sleeping until he got up to go to work, real work. So was I an entrepreneur here? A little bit. Did I take risk? No, not a lot of risk. So between the ages of 18 to 24, I was very socially introverted. I didn't go out much. I didn't party much. And look at that. I got a bachelor's in mathematics. Can you believe getting a bachelor's in mathematics? Master's courses in computer science? Working as a database programmer? What kind of a person was I? I was a nerd. I was a real nerd. The only thing missing in my life were glasses. I didn't wear any glasses. But otherwise, I would have been a perfect nerd, sitting in the corner with my glasses. Now, something happened in 1984. I was 24 years old, and I got this call from a friend of mine in New York City, and he said to me, Paris, I have a job for you in venture capital. But there's one condition. You're a nerd, and nerds don't do well in venture capital. So I need to take the nerd out of you. So I've prepared a training program just for you. Six months. Will you do it? I said, yes, I'll do it. Can you imagine New York City venture capital? Wow, 1984? This was the big, this is like boom town. So I moved to New York City. I packed my truck, I rented a U-Haul truck, and I moved all my belongings to New York City. And on Monday morning, I waited for my boss to pick me up to go to work. Well, he said to me, we're not going to the office. I'm going to take you to a place that I have paid for, I've paid people at this company to hire you for three months. And what you are going to do during the first three months is to sell on the telephone. So we arrived to a location in Soho, about 16th Street on the west side. And there was a room like this. 
and there were probably 40 young people on the telephone selling encyclopedias around the country. And there was a board like this, and you see the names of the people who had sold the most encyclopedias that week. And I arrived there, and I couldn't believe this. I mean, I was, you know, I went to Boston University, bachelor's, my master's work, and I could see all these young people that were like 18 years old, dropouts from high school. And I was wearing my jacket and my tie, and I said, what am I doing here? And my boss said, you are going to learn to sell on the telephone. You're going to call around the country and sell encyclopedias. And he said to me, I'm only going to come and see you once a week on Friday. And the only thing I'm going to do is open that door, and I'm going to look at the board to see if your name is there. And I thought, oh, my God. Talk about emotional distress. Well, let me tell you, the first week I didn't sell anything. The second week I couldn't sell anything. I was going crazy because my boss, people were laughing on Fridays because they were always thinking, I wonder when Paris's boss will show up. And he, he was a little guy in a suit, and he would arrive in his limousine. He would open that door and look at the board, and he would not even look at me. That's how sad I was when I, know, I knew he wasn't going to look at me. So I said to myself, this is it. I have never failed at anything, never in my life. And I don't care how much of a nerd I am, I have to get out of this nerd mentality, and I've got to learn to sell. So I worked really late at night for several weeks, and I paid one of the 18-year-olds to help me, to show me how to get on the phone and talk to a stranger because I was too shy to talk to strangers. Well, I won't bore you with this, but I had like two nervous breakdowns and I was like crying three times a week because the pressure was so intense. And then on the eighth week, my boss opened the door on Friday and there I was. I was number seven. And he looked at me and he smiled. And I started to cry because it was just too emotional for me. But I can tell you, at the end of the three months, I was number two. I was selling encyclopedias to anybody. Hontoni. Well, I thought, well, I've succeeded, right? He said, Paris, now comes the hard part. You have to learn to sell face to face. It's easy to sell over the telephone. Now you're going to learn to sell face to face. So he said to me, on Monday, don't wear a suit, wear a jacket, pants. It's not going to be like telemarketing. It'll be a different kind of company. So he picked me up on Monday, and we went to Central Park South, to a very fancy office on the 22nd floor overlooking Central Park. And the name on the door said American Millionaires Club. And I sat down in the room. And there was this guy there that sat down with us, and my boss was with me. And he said to my boss, so this is the guy? So you're going to pay me to train him? My boss said, yes. I said, what is this? Let me explain to you, son. This is the American Millionaires Club. This is where we provide happiness to American couples. I said, what? We are a dating service. In New York City, there are three million single people. People that usually own dogs or some other pet. They've been divorced two or three times. They can't hold a relationship. So we are there to make them happy. We send flyers out every week, and then we send out a relationship analyst. The relationship analyst has to sit with each candidate for an hour and go under their skin, build trust, understand why that person is alone in life. What happened that they're alone, that they've been divorced so many times, or they can't hold the relationship? And then for the next hour, once they trust you, you need to convince them that the American Millionaires Club 
where they're going to have a videotape that shows them and they can meet other people with common interests without going through all the complexities of meeting people cold on the street or at a party, how that can improve the chances that they will meet the love of their life. And then once you've convinced them of that, you need to get their credit card number and call it in to the office. So they pay $1,500 to join for a year. I thought I was going to die when I heard this. And I looked at my boss and I said, you want me to do this? And he looked at me and he said, Paris, until you take the nerd out of your body, and until you are able to sell anything to anybody, you will not change. Well, to make a long story short, I had to go to three of these interviews every day. I met some of the strangest people you will ever meet in your life. I mean, I met little old ladies that were retired actresses from Hollywood living in New York that wanted to find a husband. I met investment bankers that were nasty, nasty people. I met all kinds of people. Well, let me tell you, for the first month, I couldn't sell a single one. I dropped out of this program several times, and my boss would always come back to me and push me, say, Paris, you did it in the telemarketing company. You can do it here. Well, to make a long story short, I survived. And at the end, the last three weeks, I was selling two of these a day. I had changed as an individual. I was continuously being pulled out of my professional comfort zone. I was going in and out for six months. And finally, I went out. So my professional identity was different. I felt comfortable now with ambiguity. I felt comfortable selling. I could sell anything to anybody on the phone or face to face. So I joined the venture capital firm, and after three months, I was approached by a bank, Union Bank of Switzerland. They hired me, and I spent 10 years there doing mergers and acquisitions. And then I spent 11 years at ABN AMRO Bank. I was the youngest managing director at ABN AMRO Bank in the year 2000. I could not have done any of this without that training program, because I was a programmer. I was a technical person. I hated speaking in public. I hated negotiating. I hated expressing myself. Now, sure, I could have changed over many years and ar arrived at the same place. And I don't recommend that any of you do a training program like the one I did. But it did change my professional life. So for 20 years, I was an investment banker. And then one day, I turned 42 in the year 2002, and this was in London. I don't know how many of you know London, but London at 4.30 in the afternoon, it's usually raining, it's dark outside. One of these days I was in London looking outside my window and I said to myself, I'm not happy here anymore. I'm becoming a Friday person again. What can I do? Well, let me tell you, I was very lucky because I received a phone call almost by coincidence about a year later from Sony, an executive here in Japan at Sony Corporation. And he said to me, Paris, I have a problem. Sony and Family Mart want to organize a football team friendly match tour. Can you find somebody that will bring a football team to Japan to play three friendly matches. We have $2 million for that. So that's not enough money for Barcelona or for uh, Real Madrid or, or Manchester United, but you know, maybe you can get a nice team. So I went home that night thinking about this request. And I thought to myself, is this my opportunity to leave the bank? Could this be my calling? Well, the next day, I said to my wife, honey, I'm leaving the bank. And she said to me, leaving the bank? Where are you going? Morgan Stanley? Goldman Sachs? 
I said, no. I want to become a sports marketing professional. She looked at me and said, what have you been smoking? I mean, we have this beautiful apartment. I mean, those of you who know London, to have a three-bedroom apartment in London with three bathrooms overlooking South Kensington Station, Sogoi. That is a fancy place. You want to leave all this at the top of your career in banking, investment banking, to do what? You don't even like football. I said, yes, but I'm not happy anymore here. Well, let me tell you, I quit the bank, and I decided to find a football team. And I did find a football team. I found a football team in Valencia. Valencia football team had just won the La Liga in Spain. But nobody knew Valencia in Japan. So I had to find a way for Valencia to become famous in Japan. So I talked to my friend at Sony, and he said, well, what if we maybe take a movie star there? And he said, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, what movie star could we take? Well, if you remember The Last Samurai, the movie, it was pretty popular in the West. And Koyuki Kato, which was the actress of The Last Samurai, she was here in Japan. So I thought, let's find a way to bring her to Valencia. We convinced Koyuki to come to Valencia. And all of a sudden, 20 million Japanese were watching Koyuki hit the ball in Valencia for a football game. In 2004, I brought the Japanese, uh, the Valencia football team to Japan. And we had one of the most profitable preseasons that this country has ever seen. We did such a good job in 2004 that in 2005, I brought Barcelona to Japan. And also in 2007. Look at the smile on my face. Am I alive? Now, I was making much less money than in the bank in that picture and in all my sports career. But I was happy. I was a Monday person again. So between 1984 and today, I have done five startups. Of those five, three have failed miserably. But two have done OK. These are the two that did OK. Amazing Latino is an advertising agency in Madrid for the Hispanic community. It's doing all right, nothing to write home about. And Swiss Risk is a CRM company I have in Germany with a Spanish partner of mine, which is doing really well. And then last year, I did a video game, which was a terrible failure on Xbox Connect. So what am I doing today? Today, my main preoccupation is not entrepreneurship in terms of startups, although I do a few here and there. Today, I'm an academic. I teach at IE Business School. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship, and I head the Venture Lab, which is where all the new deals show up. And I got my PhD last year. I started my PhD six years ago. Now, let me tell you what I did my PhD on, because that is really why I'm here talking to you today. I decided to study a type of person a type of person that was very similar to the way I was when I had arrived in New York City. Remember that person? What was the name of that person? A nerd, right? So I decided to study nerds. But I didn't want to call them nerds, because that's not a nice word. So this is what I found when I started to study these people in companies. Number one. They don't like leaving their professional comfort zones. You remember me when I arrived at the telemarketing place? Ooh, that hurt. And the dating group, oh, that was terrible. So I, it was uncomfortable stepping, stepping out of my professional comfort zone. Struggle with ambiguity. They don't like ambiguous situations. They like mathematics a lot, usually. 
They're obsessed with objectivity. They don't like opinions. They want to know only facts. Yes, facts. They believe that the more information, the more certainty. Oh, how many times has that happened to you? Only five? Oh, that's not good enough. Maybe five million, then I'll believe you. Are you that type of a person? They have a fairly closed mind professionally. They struggle in negotiations, and they don't communicate well. So I decided to call these people quants. The world is full of quants. Most of you here today are quants. But people don't admit they're quants. I was a quant. But I got lucky because I went through that training program that almost killed me to unquant me. What's going to unquant you? Maybe if you're studying in this school, you're already being unquanted. So I studied quants in many types of companies, engineering firms, investment banks, even the military. I went to West Point to study quants in the military. Lots of quants there. Accountants, programmers, consultants, even marketing companies have quants. So think about this. Do you have a closed mind? Do you experiment at work? Are you wearing intellectual blinders? So do you think people are born quants? Look at this. This is a picture of me when I was born. No, that's not really me. They didn't have cameras back then. But I probably looked like a quant when I was born. Probably the first thing that I said to my mother was, what time is it? Or something nerdy. Now, my sister was totally different. She had a very open mind. She wasn't a nerd. She was partying all the time. But no, we are not born quants. As you will hear in a few minutes from Dr. Mario Alonso, children are the most unquant of all the creatures in the world. We become quants over time. Culture, education, a bit of everything. Now, a lot of people ask me, and when I was doing my research, I found that we have two different comfort zones, our personal one and our professional one. Remember that nerd that arrived in New York City? Well, he was very nerdy, both professionally and as a person. I hated, when I was a nerd, I hated ambiguity in my personal life. I hated to experiment in my personal life. I have not changed in my personal life. I'm 52 years old, and you are never going to see me wearing an earring or a skirt. I'm very traditional, and I have a very small personal comfort zone. I hate ambiguity. So what does that mean? It means that you do not need to change as a person to open your professional mind. That's a very important statement. Haven't you always heard people say, oh, Johnny, he's never going to be a big success in business. He's very shy. A lot of people always are saying, you know, Johnny or Mary, they're too shy. They're too much of an introvert. Oh, he's, you know, he's Korean. He's very introverted. He's not going to, he doesn't like to speak out. I was at Stanford last year, and there was a professor there that said to me, Paris, I think you're wrong, because I was talking about my thesis about quants. And he said to me, I think you're wrong. I think that you need to change as a person in order to open your professional mind. And I said, really? 
well, let me show you an example, I said to him. And there was another professor there, very well known at Stanford, who ran entrepreneurship in the engineering department. And I said, when you look at Roy over here, and Roy was like, why are you picking on me? I said, well, Roy, Roy has a PhD in engineering. Now, Roy's very famous. Roy can stand here and talk in front of everybody and sell anything, right? And Roy said, yes, yeah, I'm a pretty good salesperson. So the nerd is a good salesperson, I said to everybody. He says, yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. I put Roy in front of 50 people, he can sell them anything. Now, if I put Roy in a discotheque with 50 women, how many do you think Roy can pick up? And Roy was like this. I said, Roy, why don't you tell the audience how many women, women you can pick up at the end of the night? Well, Roy came up to the microphone and he went like this. He said, zero. I'm a shy guy. But wait, I said, you're a shy guy? You just told me you could sell anything to 50 people. Yeah, but I'm a shy guy. Now, Asia is full of people that are shy. Asia is full of people that have a small personal comfort zone. But that doesn't mean that you cannot expand professionally. It doesn't mean you can't be creative, that you can't innovate. You don't need to be like a Hollywood person in order to talk Hollywood or Silicon Valley. That's a very important statement because in the past, Asia has been able to succeed and excel by being smart and disciplined. Those days are over. You now need to be smart, disciplined, and you need to have an open mind. Just look at what Samsung is doing. At Sony, they have nightmares at night thinking about Samsung. And it's only going to get worse. As I said to you, the Chinese are getting every day better and they're looking every day more like the Japanese. There's only one difference. We just had four days of chats in China. When we finished our talk, a group like yours, how many people do you think asked questions? Of 50 people in the room, how many people do you think asked very deep questions after our talk? Almost 50. When we went to Korea, we were at Hyundai. How many people do you think asked a question after our talk? Zero. Not one. Why? Because all kinds of reasons. Closed minds. What are people going to say? Oh, you know, the sense of the ridicule, losing face in front of your colleagues. We can't continue that way. The Chinese are not only getting better, they're disciplined, they're smart, and they're opening their minds at a faster rate than anybody else in Asia. That is scary. This is a picture of me six months ago here in Tokyo. I spoke to a group of about 100 students. And at the end of the speech, five students came up to me and said, Professor, we are quants. I said, good. The first step to changing your professional life is to admit that you are a quant and then to work every day at changing that situation, at unquanting. And they asked me, what can we do to unquant? I said, well, the first thing you can do is get an MBA. That'll help you unquant. Just think about it. I mean, here you are at one of the top MBA schools in Japan with an emphasis on venture capital and entrepreneurship. That's a great way to open your mind. Now, you can also open your mind by going to live in another country, maybe. We at IE Business School open people's minds every day because we have 
80 different nationalities in our student body. Working with people from another country will open your mind. I have a student of mine from Korea in IE, and she says to me, Professor, I have found a way to unquant every week. I said, well, what are you doing? She says, I have made a point, since I'm such a shy person, every week I find one stranger, and I talk to them for an hour. I said, good. That'll unquant you. So, quoting Robert Kiyosaki, the next 10 years are going to be vicious. The amount of change that we are going to see over the next 10 years is amazing. We have to prepare for that. As I said to you, I was at Stanford last year, and I spent a lot of time at Google and Zynga. And what I found in Silicon Valley is that most good Silicon Valley companies are all looking for exactly the same things in their employees. They want analytical reasoning, which is great. They want quants, right? But then they want communication skills. That's not good if you're a quant. Willingness to experiment. There goes the quant again. And they want passion. So if someone is going to meet these requirements, like the head of HR at Google said to me, she said to me, Paris, I've read your thesis, and I don't think we have any quants in our company because we don't want quants. We want these people. That's what makes us different. These are the people that innovate and are creative. People with communication skills that can sell themselves, that can experiment at the office. This is not about becoming a startup entrepreneur. This is about becoming a corporate entrepreneur within a company. Silicon Valley is a mindset. It is about thinking like an entrepreneur. Remember what I asked you at the beginning of this lecture? Can anybody be an entrepreneur? No, very few people can be entrepreneurs. It takes going out of your personal comfort zone to become an entrepreneur because you need to take risk. Look at me. Am I an entrepreneur? I'm a comfortable entrepreneur. I was you know, selling lemonade, then delivering the paper. When did I become an entrepreneur? In 1984. Was I an entrepreneur when I came to Japan to do this? Maybe. But are you an entrepreneur when you've been an investment banker for 20 years? No. I was a comfortable entrepreneur. Even today, I'm a comfortable entrepreneur. I mean, entrepreneurship takes really taking risk. So nobody, as I said, not everybody is going to be an entrepreneur, but everybody needs to think like an entrepreneur. And especially here in Japan now, we need to unquant. And the way to unquant is to experiment, to communicate better. Before I end, this is one of my idols. And one of the things I love about this man is that he was obsessed with the idea that we should not settle. A lot of people always ask me, Paris, why? Did you leave the investment bank? My wife asks me that usually a lot as well. She says, why did you leave the investment bank? Well, let me tell you why I left the investment bank. Because I realized that night, that long night when I couldn't sleep, that someday when I was about to die, and I was hopefully 80 or something, you never know, but hopefully. When I thought about my life, I didn't think that I would regret the things that I've done. But I was sure that I was going to regret a lot of things that I didn't do. And that would probably be one of them. Can you imagine thinking there, wow, imagine if I had gone to Japan Maybe my wife, my life would have changed. And it did change. I discovered this beautiful country and its people. But I also changed my professional life. So 
As Steve Jobs says, life is too short for us to settle. I mean, the fact that you are studying an MBA is a good first step that you realize you need a change in your life. Now what are you going to do with that MBA? There's a story I love about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was, this is about 10 years ago, he was trying to hire John Scully. John Scully was president of Pepsi-Cola at the time. And, you know, John Scully was not interested in going to work at Apple. Apple was a good company back then, but it wasn't like now that famous. So Steve Jobs would call him and email him and call him and say, you know, John, will you join Apple? And, and, Steve, and, and John was like, hey, I'm president of Pepsi. Why would I join Apple? So finally, Steve Jobs came all the way to New York City and had dinner with John Scully in his home. And after a few glasses of wine, and Steve knew that it was going to be tough, but because John kept saying all night, you know, I love you, I love Apple, but I'm not going to join. Finally, Steve Jobs looked at John Scully in the eyes. And he said, John, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling water that tastes like sugar? Or do you want to change the world? Well, John Scully joined Apple a few months later. Now, I know I'm not going to change the world, and I don't think any of you here are going to change the world, probably. But believe me, it will change your life to step out of your professional comfort zone every day, just a little bit. Find something that you can do to unquant. And the first thing you can do is to realize that you are a quant, if you are one. There's nothing wrong with being a quant. The world is full of quants. This country is probably 95% quant, but that's okay. This country is very great. You've come a long way, but the rules of the past are not going to work in the future. It's a new business model out there. The Chinese are playing a different game. The Koreans are playing a different game. And that's just two countries. Everybody else is going to start to play a different game. So you need to reinvent yourself, in the words of Dr. Mario Alonso. And the first step to reinventing yourself is to unquanting. Thank you. Good night. I'm so happy you've been here. It's my first visit to Japan. So I'm very excited having the opportunity of sharing with all of you something which is very dear to me. You know, I am very interested in the educational process. And I don't know how the educational system is here in Japan, but I will tell you something about the education system in the Western world. We pay a lot of emphasis to concepts and ideas. I remember when I was a child going to school that I had to learn all the kings that we had in Spain. And we had so many. And all the rivers, and we have lots of rivers. But very few people told us how we could get a deeper understanding of meaningful things in life. Things that really can change our lives for the better. Very few people, very few teachers really explained to us what was hidden within ourselves. And as a child, I noticed in myself this lack of inspiration. So much knowledge and so little inspiration. And I decided to study what was within ourselves that made us different? And when you are thinking, when you are considering to change something in your life, it's important that you design your pathway, your map. And you got to ask yourself a question, where am I now? And it's important that you are honest with yourself, that you are authentic with yourself. And then you've got to ask yourself another question. 
Where do I need to be? And then we can see the gap, the space between where I am now, no matter if I like it or I don't like it, where I am now and where I need to be. And don't be disappointed if you see that the gap is very big because you can feel it. You can feel any gap. And you need to know the ingredients that we need in order to fill that gap. So let me share with you something which is very personal. I didn't plan to become a physician. I didn't plan to become a surgeon. I love animals. You have so many beautiful animals here in Japan. You know that you have a special kind of ape that lives very close to the snow? Well, my parents knew that I wanted to become a, a, a biologist. But one day, when I was around 13 or 14 years old, I was watching TV at that time in Spain, because I'm 56, at that time, long time ago, at that time the TV was only black and white. I was moved by something, an earthquake in Latin America, and a lot of people suffering. At that moment, at that precise moment, I felt a calling within myself. Mario, you got to do something to make a difference. I know that here at Globis, you put a lot of emphasis on that. Make a difference. Make a difference, not only in your life, make a difference in the life of other people. So I changed my mind. I went to my father and I told him, Daddy, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to be a biologist. I'm going to be a physician. Well, my father said, that's okay. Go ahead. I said, so easy. Okay, good. So I signed up to start my medical studies, and I was very, very fortunate because the summer before I started studying medicine, I bought a book, a book about the history of medicine, and I read something which changed my whole life. And because I read that book, I am so fortunate of being now with you here in Tokyo. What did I read? I read that 27 centuries ago, some Greek physicians had made an outstanding discovery. You can help a human being to heal his or her disease just using words. They explained the power of communication. They were able to relate with another human being who was suffering a very serious disease in such a way that something opened up in those patients and they started to recover. They didn't know what was going on. It was not science. They didn't use any specific kind of mm, uh, drugs or, 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 or surgical techniques. So they call it the medical art. So when I went into the medical school, I thought that they were going to teach me something about the medical art. What do you think? Did they teach me anything about the medical art? No. They only spoke about organs, the liver, the pancreas, the lungs, the biochemical reactions, the cells. And I was looking for the human being. Where is the person? Look at the liver. But, but there is a person who has liver. No, look at the liver. Look at the anatomy. You got to learn the anatomy. So I remember when I was uh, um, a student and I went to the hospital going with the professor. And, you know, we, we stopped at the patient's bed. And he told us, look at this liver. You know, and the poor patient was looking at us. See how big is this liver. Look at the yellow color. It's called jaundice. And the poor patient was. So I decided 
to start my personal research to find out how could I, as a physician, reach that potential. That potential that the Greeks, 27 centuries ago, discovered. And that's what I am so delighted to share with you. So, how could we maximize our potential as a person? It's important to know that we do not have to become a different person. We can be our best. So, unleashing our inner potential is not about that you have to become somebody else. It's that you can become your best you. So, I only have one message. I know it's just a message, but I believe so much in that message. If you want to open up your potential, if you want to flourish as a human being, let your faith and your passion be bigger than your fear. Have faith in yourself and in your potential. Have faith in the potential of other human beings. You know, I feel that I am in my family. So I will tell you another story of my life. As I told you, I was very, very um, in love with animals and biology. So I remember once that I asked my father, Daddy, could you please buy me a microscope? Because I want to have a look at the cells. He said, okay, Mario, you're a, a good son. Let's go and look for some microscopes. So he took me to a store. I'm talking many, many, many years ago. And I saw a microscope. It was a Japanese microscope. And it was so beautiful. But then the person who was in charge of the store told my father, don't buy your son that microscope. And my father asked, why? Because it's Japanese. And Japanese is not good quality. I'm talking many years ago. Buy your son a size microscope. It's German. It's much better. Your country, because of your faith, and because of your passion, has become one of the most advanced countries in the world. You are number one in robotics. Number one. You have some of the best microscopes in the whole world. Some of the best technology in the whole world. Some of the best physicians. Some of the best of everything. Why? Because you decided to believe in yourself as a country. Because you decided to unleash your power as a nation. And all these people who didn't have faith in you had to acknowledge how great you are as a country. So see in your own country how you created the country that now you are because of your faith and your passion. So what is the definition of potential? Aristotle, in the third, third century before Jesus Christ was born, explains very well what is potential. But it's a little bit messy, his language. So I will use a metaphor. What do you see here? It's not a tricky question, I promise you. What do you see here? I'm sure you are seeing something. <laughs> I'm sure you have seen something. What do you see? I promise you it's not a tricky question. What do you see? Yes, exactly, it's a caterpillar. But it's true that the caterpillar has some yellow dots, some black stains. Look beyond. What do you see? Look beyond the caterpillar. Go deeper. What do you see? You see a butterfly. 
So this is potential. The potential to fly in life is in all of you without any exception. In the same way that the caterpillar has that potential to fly. But the caterpillar trusts nature. Many times we do not trust ourselves. And the sad thing, as Paris explains so beautifully, is that many times before we die, we are very aware of the potential that was not awakening within ourselves. So now that we are so you know, fortunate to be alive, in that beautiful, you know, kind of uh, um, white uh, flag that you have there, write your mission in life. Why you are going to make a difference, not only for yourself, but also for other people. So, what is the potential that we need to awaken? The first one is creativity. I practiced martial arts for many years. And if I had to learn judo, I would try to look for Jigoro Kano. If I had to practice karate, I would look for Sensei Funakoshi. If I had to practice Aikido, I would look for Morihei Ueshiba. Always look for masters in life. So who are the masters in creativity? Paris already told us. Children. But as a father, I have three kids. When I look at my kids, many times I see people who need to learn. And I don't see that the person who needs to learn the most is myself. And that lack of humility prevents me from learning. So I will tell you why children are the most creative people on earth. These are statistics that were performed in Italy, the United States, and the United Kingdom. So, look, if you give a creativity test to children between three and five years old, 90% of the children pass the, creative, the creativity test. 98%, only 2% fail. But look at the slide. Now the children are between eight and 10 years old, and only 38% Pass the creativity test. You give the same creativity test to the children who pass here, and now only 10% pass. Let's be honest. Any of you are more than 15 years old? Yes. If you give a creativity test, to a children or an, a young adult who is more than 15 years old, only 2% pass the exam. This is the reason why many years ago, the director of the Brain Institute in Milan said, we are born geniuses and we end up jerks, like stupid people. A woman was there and she raised her hand. Professor, professor, I need to ask a question. Yes. What's the question? If I was born a genius and I ended up being a jerk, what is in the middle? And he said, the educational system. Paris explained it wonderfully. We are not born quiet. The educational system punishes us. And this is not to blame teachers. Gandhi said, if you point at somebody, do not forget that three fingers are pointing at you. So we all can take responsibility in changing the educational system to improve it. Instead of blaming other people, what can I do to make a difference in the education system? So the question is not how creative you are. Because all of us are, are more than 15 years old. And if we ask this question, probably none of us would raise a hand and say, I'm creative. The question is not that. The question is, what makes you creative and what prevents you from being creative? 
And it's fascinating, the answer of these questions. And the person who discovered that is Teresa Mabili. She is a full professor at Harvard. And she discovered that passion is what makes us creative. And fear, fear of failure, fear of not being good enough is what prevents us from being creative. And you might ask yourself, but Mario, what's the relationship between passion and being creative? The activating reticular system, which is in the middle of the brain, and I will explain it very clearly. When you are passionate about something, you start to see that thing in the street. Yes or no? You are really thinking about buying a new motorbike. But you are not that sure. And then you start seeing that motorbike all over. You are happy because as a woman, they told you that you are pregnant. And you start to see pregnant women all over. Why? Because the activating reticular system lights up the whole brain when you are motivated about something. So this is the connection between motivation and creativity. You see more things, so you see more alternative pathways. So if fear to failure is what prevents us from being creative, we have to relate to failure in a completely different way. This is always what we call a learning curve. And at the beginning, we make mistakes because we are learning something new. If I start to learn Japanese, as I'm going to do, you know, after three months, I will speak very poorly. But that's part of the process. If I'm harsh with myself, if I use this disempowering voice, oh, Mario, you are so clumsy. You have been studying Japanese for three months, and you cannot utter a word. You will not be able to speak Japanese. No way. It's too difficult. And you are too stupid. So it's kind of dialogue, no? Oh, oh, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Then I will quit. But if I stop this voice and shut up, shut up, my faith and my passion is bigger than you. And you keep trying, then little by little, you start to be competent. And later on, you become a master. So do not be harsh with yourself when you make a mistake. Instead of pointing the finger at you, give the hand. And if somebody makes a mistake, instead of pointing the finger at that person and, 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 and telling that person, I told you, give that person a hand so that this person can stand up and get back on track. You know how much time it takes to mend a broken heart. You know, many people in companies are hired because they are very good technically. And they are fired when they treat people poorly. So everything needs a technical part. That's the science. Don't forget the art. We human beings are not machines. And therefore, we don't like to be treated as things. So how can we improve learning capacity? You know, when I was at the medical school, I had some courses on psychology. And we had a professor, a woman, who was very tough on the subject. And she said, you know, um, the personality of a human being is determined when that person is seven years old. You cannot change as a person after that age. So I raised my hands, a professor. But I want to change some things in my personality. How old are you? I'm 19. It's too late. Well, that's not right. Many people think that they cannot learn a new language because they are too old. I remember 
a person from the United States who entered into the medical school when he was 80 years old. He finished and he practiced medicine for some years. So he fought for his passion. You know, I'm so proud when I speak about Ramon y Cajal because he has meant so much in my life. I didn't have the, I mean, the opportunity to, to know him because he died many, many years ago. He won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1906 when all the Nobel Prizes were won by Germany. And he said, all human beings can become, if they truly want, sculptures of their own brain. Cajal had an intuition. He couldn't prove it. But he thought that something in the neurons change when you are passionate about learning new things, no matter what's your age, when you create in your possibilities, when you have faith. He had discovered in this lab something in the neurons that nobody else had seen before him. He discovered in the neurons these strange structures called spikes because they reminded him the spikes of a rose. And he knew that spikes increase in number when you were learning something new. And he thought that when you are committed, when you are passionate, when you have faith in yourself, you increase the number of spikes. Well, Ramon y Cajal was right. Now we know using modern techniques that the process called neuroplasticity, in which new neurons connect with other neurons, is real. But that process is determined by how you feel in front of a challenge. If you feel that you don't have any choice, this process doesn't take place. If I start learning Japanese and I listen to the voice, you are wasting your time, you will learn nothing, why you waste your time, I will not have any neuroplasticity. But if I create another voice, Mario, if you are really passionate about this culture, you will learn the language. It will take some time, but you will learn. The neuroplasticity takes place, and you know that from your own experience. You know that when you are passionate about something, you learn at a different speed. You know perfectly from your own experience that when you are passionate about something, you do not forget. This is the reason, neuroplasticity. And it happens at all ages. We also know now that stem cells, multipotential cells, which are located in the ventricles, the cavities of the brain, when you are passionate about learning something new, when despite the fact that you might feel lost, you keep your faith, you keep looking for new opportunities, we know now, as a proof, not as an opinion, that there is a migration of stem cells from the ventricles of the brain to a structure called the hippocampus, in which they are transformed in new neurons. The process takes place in three weeks. This is the reason why it takes around three weeks to create a new habit, new neurons. So what this professor told me many years ago was not right. You can reinvent yourself. In order to do that, you got to feel passionate about what you are doing. As Paris was explaining previously, we need to be Monday people. People who are passionate about what we are doing in life. Energy. You know, many times we are tired. I mean, I understand now it's late. It's a quarter past eight. You have been probably working, studying, and you are tired. Do you think that you will wake up and keep moving just because... Your intellectual mind tells you, oh, this material is interesting. Keep paying attention. No. But if you feel the passion, if you feel the inspiration, you will feel the energy. Leadership. I'm not going to talk about the leaders who show up on TV or on the newspapers. I'm talking about all of you. 
I'm talking about people who make a difference in life. I'm talking about people who inspire other people to believe in themselves and in their possibilities. I'm talking about people who are able to inspire people so much that they put together all their knowledge, all their commitment, and all the passion to create what we call a mastermind. I'm talking about people who can align the motivation of a group of people towards a common goal. I'm talking about people, leaders, who help us get rid of pressure when we're in an uncertain world. This is the Katrina hurricane, which was terrible. But it, if you look in the center, you see what we call the eye of the hurricane. It's a place of equilibrium. It's a place of stability. Leaders inspire people in such a way that when they see that other members of the team are suffering, they help them. Leaders also inspire people to stretch themselves much more and to take bigger risks because they feel supported. Paris was telling us, we need to take some risks. We've got to use our intelligence. We've got to use our heart. And we've got to take some risks. But you will not take those risks if you feel that you are not supported. So we also need to remove some of the obstacles. And one of the main obstacles is when we think that the future is something that we enter that the circumstances are the only thing that determine our future. Well, let me share with you something that you already know. The future is not something that we enter. The future is something that we create. And we create with our decisions. We create with our passion. We create with our faith and our commitment. And I will give you an example. This little girl on the left of the screen she was born in Alabama at the end of the 19th century. When she was 16 months old, she got very sick, very sick. She had probably a meningitis or encephalitis, we don't know for sure. But the end result was that when she recovered from the disease, she was blind, deaf, and mute. She couldn't see, she couldn't speak, she couldn't hear. She was so frustrated that developed a very violent character. Her parents tried to help her, but it was impossible. So they threw the towel. There's nothing that we can do to help little Helen have a future. But then a true leader showed up on the scene. A woman, her name was Annie Sullivan. And when she looked at Helen Keller, she didn't see what the rest of the people was seeing. A blind girl, a deaf girl, and a mute girl. She saw the potential. She saw the butterfly. And because she had faith in that potential, and because she was passionate about awakening that potential, Helen Keller became the first woman in history who graduated with honors from Harvard University. Here you can see Helen Keller and Sullivan playing chess. A news reporter, because she was such a famous lady, a news reporter interviewed her using the language for the deaf and mute through the touch, because she couldn't see. And he asked her, um, Mrs. Keller, let me ask you a difficult question. Is there anything worse than being blind? What a question, huh? Is there anything worse than being blind? Listen to Helen Keller's answer. Yes, sir. It's worse if you can see, but you don't have a vision. Because depending on how you see the future, you live in the present. So how can you live your present with enthusiasm and passion if you do not have a compelling vision? If you are not creating a dream to make a difference, Winston Churchill, he said, attitude is a little thing. Yes, but
but makes a big difference. So in front of a challenge, be careful with your inner talk, with that voice. Why? Because using functional magnetic resonance and some um, psychological test, we now know that when we speak harshly to ourselves, there is a change in the blood flow of this part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. The blood that should go to this area goes to other areas. So the neurons which are located there start to receive less glucose and less oxygen. What is the result? A decrease in your capacity to analyze. You make poor decisions. You are easily distracted. You have difficulties learning, and there is a lack of creativity. See the power of your inner voice. That's the reason why you have to be your best friend and not your worst enemy. And when you make, make a mistake, you got to acknowledge that you made a mistake because you dare to try, because you were courageous enough to leave your comfort zone. Do not judge before exploring. Paris was explaining how important it is to keep an open mind. I will show you a slide. Let's see what you see here. I will ask some questions. I will always raise my hand. Nobody will be alone. Any of you see an elephant? Okay. Any of you sees a camel? Any of you sees a bird? Okay. Look beyond. Open your mind. What do you see now? If you don't see anything mm, new, don't worry. It doesn't have any kind of psychological connotations. So don't worry. Do you see something different? Look, let's go to this screen on the left. This is an island with two trees. This is a fish. I know you love fish. You see the eye and the fin? Here's a boat and a Mexican guy. Because he has a hat, a mustache, must be Mexican. He's not neither from Japan nor from Spain, must be from Mexico. So. Everything is in reality, but many times we have a closed mind. We judge too fast. We judge people from other culture. We judge people from different backgrounds. So we do not listen. It's very difficult to create a bridge with other cultures if we don't listen, if we judge, because we are different. So we only see what we expect to see. What are you going to see? A clown, a policeman, or an athlete? Are you ready for the test? Let's go for it. Any of you saw a policeman? Any of you saw an athlete? Any of you saw a clown? Look beyond. Open your mind. I see some people like having a kind of tick. <laughs> but that's interesting. Bend your neck. Let's see if you see something different. The first person who says a word which represents what is in the slide will get a book, a free book. What is inside? What is there? Please, sir. A circus, you got a book. Okay. Look, this is a tent. You see the tent? Okay. This is a kind of seal or a dog, we don't know, with a balloon. You see the balloon? You see a man on a motor monocycle and two rings. You see a woman disguised as a mermaid with another balloon. You see one, two, three, four, five fences and two horses. You see it? The seal with the balloon, a man on a, motor, on a motorcycle with two rings. This is the right arm, the left arm. This is the head, a 
a woman disguised as a mermaid with a balloon, one, two, three, four, five fences and two horses. Do you see it? Everything is in reality. So open your mind. Learn from other people. Be humble enough to acknowledge that reality is so complex that we all can learn from everybody else. So, some proposals. Think big. Your country, Japan, is an example of that. Kaizen. You have a big vision, a compelling vision that is pulling your heart. Have a strategy. You cannot say, oh, I'm passionate about. I'm a lot of faith. Do you have a strategy? No, I don't need it. Yes, you need it. <laughs> you need a strategy. You don't need a perfect strategy. You need a strategy. And act small. Little steps every day, thinking that this little step is taking you towards the, your goal. This is a beautiful story from the Middle Age period in Europe. And I will share with you because it might be of some interest. There was somebody who was watching at four people who were building a wall made of stone. And he looked at the four of them and they looked so different. So he approached the first one and asked him, uh, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Don't you see it? I'm putting a stone on top of another one. OK, sir, I'm sorry. He approached the second one, who was doing exactly the same, apparently. Excuse me, sir, what are, what are you doing? Oh, you see, I'm, I'm building a wall. I, this is a very poor job, but I have to feed my family, and it's all that I have been able to find. OK. He approached the third one was a Monday person. And he asked him, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building a cathedral. And then he approached the last one. Excuse me, sir, what are you doing? I'm building a monument to God. So when we have that dream, when we are passionate about that dream, our mind opens up. So think big, have a strategy, and act small. So when the sky is the limit, the sky is the limit when your heart is in it. I promise you, without any doubt, if you create a dream and you think not only about yourself, but about other people too. If you have faith and you are passionate about, you don't know how far you can go. Attitude is a little thing, which means a big difference. Thank you so much. Uh, first to Paris. Um, you said um, you had a beautiful apartment in London, and uh, you were the youngest uh, managing director in ABN Amro Bank. Uh, you're 42, and all of a sudden, there's a call from a person in, in Sony. And he said, can you bring a football team to Tokyo? Um, ca can you go through what went on in, in your mind? You, you said, you weren't as enjoying investment banking as you were in the past. You, you said you became a Friday person. But to make that jump, and uh, I, I feel the same with uh, Parisan's wife, it, it must have been very hard to accept. Um, can, can you um, sh share with us what went through your mind in, in taking that phone call and, and you know, s s stepping out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dean. Um, well, I think the best way to express what, what I felt was very similar to what Professor Mario Alonso mentioned to us. I had this voice. 
And this voice was telling me, you know, success in life today is measured through money. And this voice was telling me, you have much more to succeed. And not only the voice was telling me that, but a lot of friends were telling me that. Uh, you know, a lot of people were telling me, you should not make this decision. But as I said to you in my speech, in life, especially in your professional life, it's not what you do or how you do it, but why you do what you do. It has to have meaning. And I was, you know, convinced that my life had stopped having meaning professionally. 20 years doing the same thing is a long time. So it stopped having meaning. And as I also said, I started thinking about how I would feel when I was about to die. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to regret this. See, there's, a, there's an expression that I tell my students always at, um, at IE, and it's many of us have this fear of going to zero. That's what we call it in America. This fear that you're going to end up under a bridge with no friends and no money. I still have that fear in my body every day. I'm not going to be able to ever get rid of it. We have to fight it, as Mario said. And the only way you fight that fear is by having faith in yourself. Now, you know, now I work at a university, and you would think, you know, a lot of people see university professors as people who live a very comfortable life. Well, I don't go to university thinking of the university as a comfortable place. Because that's inside me. This, And as a child, my father always said to me, when you go to work, Paris, you should pretend it's your last day. It's not about what the company can do, uh, can do for you, but what you can do for the company. So in London that day, when I was you know, in this situation, I was thinking to myself, I have to follow my passion. I have to follow my gut feeling. I have to have faith. I cannot listen to that voice. Because otherwise I may regret it. And look at me. You know, this is 10 years ago. I don't regret it at all. It was the best decision that I've ever made in my professional life. Uh, now, now Mario-san. You said that um, you were reading the, um, the book of medicine. And 27 century ago, you found that Greek people found out that words can actually heal people. Uh, Parson was talking about uh, selling encyclopedia. But, but I can imagine that everyone who read the book of medicine uh, read that sentence. But I'm not sure how many you know, medical students would find meaning from, from the 27 century ago Greeks. W why did that sentence have a meaning to you? Well, I think that all of us have within ourselves a real master. And I think that that master is wise. And whenever that master hears something that is true, it creates in you a kind of vibration, like a calling. I think that many times we are too blind to see that this master exists in all of us. I know that many times we don't listen to that beautiful voice because we are so much um, so much absorbed by the surrounding noise. Why it struck me in such a way, Dean, I don't know. Um, and I humbly have to answer, I don't know. But it changed my life. 
Unfortunately, many people who go through the medical school only learn technical things. And patients now, they miss this human touch. And we now know from the medical field that when a patient knows, feels that he, she is understood by his, her physician, the immunological system which protects us against bacteria, viruses, and tumors works much better. We know that the body and the mind are part of the same reality. We know that we are one. And when you read uh, the philosophy of Morihei Shiva, when you read the Tao Te Ching, when you read Confucio, when you read Socrates, when you read Aristotle, I mean, that's wisdom. And wisdom starts the past, stands the past of time. So I think that in our culture, we, uh, which is so technically driven, we shouldn't forget humanities. We shouldn't forget how important it is communication, how important it is respect, how important is humility, how important is um, understanding. Um, once I gave a program many years ago for a bank, and I found somebody who was um, so wise. He was one of the people participating in the event that I was, you know, in some way, quote unquote, leading. And he was, uh, he had been practicing karate all his life, and he was a fifth dan of karate. And I asked him, who is your master? And he says, uh, he said, he's a Japanese uh, master, he's eighth dan. And I asked him, what have you learned from him? And he said, humility. The two of you, uh, you mentioned about inner voice. And uh, you said it is like a, a vibration, a calling. Uh, I think, and uh, if I look back when I was an MBA student, uh, I may not have had that calling. So can you explain to the students here today what kind of a thing is in a voice? What kind of a thing is going on? Marisol, maybe would you like to start us off? Uh, we have two kinds of voices. One is the voice of ego. The voice of ego is this one. And the voice of ego lives in fear and lives in isolation. So the voice of ego doesn't recognize other human beings. Only what other human beings can do for me. The voice of ego uses human beings in order, to, in order that I feel better. And there is another voice which is under that, deeper than that, is the voice of the self, of our true nature. And this is a very subtle voice. Many times you only hear that voice when you enter into meditation or when you truly care about other human beings. The best way in my experience to hear that voice is to do something for another human being without uh, expecting any return. Yes, because you care about them. If you get a return, that's fine, but you are not looking for that. So my experience is that this inner voice is the result of the connection between human beings. And the message of that inner voice is that we are one. Thank you. Per person, if there's anything to add to or... <laughs> no, I, I think, I think uh, uh, Professor Mario has expressed it very eloquently. Um, the only thing I'd, I can add that I'd like to add not as deep as, as, as Mario has in terms of you know, the meaning of an inner voice and all that, is I think that the world is so complex today that many of us never find the time to reflect. I remember when I was an investment banker. I had lots of colleagues who would 
get up at six o'clock in the morning and work out. You know, a healthy mind is a healthy body. We're taught that. Then they would show up at the office at seven o'clock and they would work like crazy. And then they would finish late and they would go to a fancy dinner with their wife or their girlfriend or whatever. And then they would drink a lot and then they would you know, work hard and play hard. That's what a lot of people do. So they never find the time to reflect on their lives. And I remember when I was in college, it was the same thing. We used to work hard and play hard, and people got drunk and had a lot of drinks, and they would never have time to actually reflect on their life because reflection is boring. It's not exciting. But that inner voice, you will only listen to that inner voice if you find some boring time where you're not doing something exciting, but you're by yourself, and you have time to think about where your life is going and whether you're happy with that. Thank you. Um, there was one incident, uh, and uh, first of all, thank you for the aid from the United States as well as from Spain. Uh, we had a terrible earthquake uh, last March, uh, and uh, I just heard uh, President Holly's class on the weekend. And Darren, were, were you with me? Yeah. And uh, Holly-san was saying that, um, to, to his surprise, he found so much energy in, in Tohoku, where the earthquake occurred. And uh, his interpretation was, was similar to what Professor Mario said. Uh, th there are so many people helping the other person, he or she might have lost his family members, but he or she is helping his her next door neighbor. And, and through that activities, uh, first of all, um, they have a, a very strong appreciation about life. Uh, they have to live for their death family members. Uh, they, have to, they have to live for the, the village members who died. And uh, as you know, Professor Mario said, um, that sense of unity mm -hmm. kind of gives the extra motivation to, to re rebuild the city, uh, to start a venture. Uh, do, do you kind of agree to like you know, disasters or some tragedy or? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Dean. Uh, I think. Two things. Uh, first of all, that when we have to face suffering, death, and evil, it's very difficult to really recover unless we work as brothers. And as Paris uh, several times uh, expressed very well, and I agree completely, it's about finding true meaning in life. Because if you go through suffering and you don't find a meaning for that suffering, you will suffer much more. If somebody that you really care uh, about dies and you don't find a meaning in that death, you will suffer much more and for much longer time. So I think that many times when we face very difficult circumstances like you did in March, you prove to the rest of the world how great is your heart. If there's anything. I, I just um, would like to share that I, I totally agree with that. And I think this sharing and this giving is not something that we should only restrict to tragedies because tragedies don't happen that often. I discovered this while I was an investment banker, which was very strange, because those people usually don't uh, do a lot of giving or sharing, <laughs> as we've seen recently. Um, but I discovered it about 10 years ago. I became a volunteer 
for something that uh, in the Christian uh, religion is very is a very uh, special place called Lourdes in uh, in southern France. And I go there every year for the last ten years, and I work there every year for a week, taking care of the sick and the elderly and the dying. And it's amazing what it does for you for the rest of the year, because as Mario said, this humility, when you are with someone that's dying of cancer or some other terminally ill disease, every day for a week, from six o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night, taking care of them, young kids, sometimes four years old, six years old, you know, mothers, and I've been doing this now for 10 years, and that week that I spend there, and when you see these people not coming to this place to want to be cured, but to give thanks, that creates humility. And I look forward to going there every year because it changes me as a person. So I think everyone needs to find a special project, something where you give without any conditions, as Mario said so well, you know, because it's easy to give if you're going to get back. Giving without any expectation and being that close to someone else's death, that's what really gives meaning in life. Um, Steve Jobs came up in your, your slides, and uh, as uh, I can imagine, uh, maybe f more than 50% of the students here today have an iPhone, or an iPad, or iPod. Um, when we look at Steve Jobs' life, uh, yes, he persuaded uh, John Scully to join Apple, but uh, he had cancer, and uh, Probably, maybe death had something to do with, with the greatness of maybe his products, his philosophy, or the company itself. How, how do you look at Apple? Maybe, person? Well, Steve uh, Jobs was um, sick at the end of his time, and sure, you know, a lot of his message messages at the end had to do with a person that knew that he didn't have many days left. But Steve Jobs is a great example of someone who had a very complicated personal life. Those of you that have read his autobiography, you know that he had a very, very complicated personal life. And he struggled with that. So I don't think he's probably the best example for anybody of you know, a, a personal life that was um, not without its complications. But he was an astounding professional. And it was that passion, that same passion, that caused him to have such a complicated personal life, that he then was able to funnel in his professional life. And what was really unique about Steve Jobs and that's why I, I really suggest that you read not only his autobiography, but a lot of the books about his speeches and talks, is that he was obsessed with the idea that people want meaning. They don't want details. When you give a presentation like the one today, people are not interested in facts and slides. People don't remember what they see. They remember a lot more what they hear, but they remember the most how you made them feel. People want meaning, and Steve Jobs was a master of that. He wanted somehow to change the world for everyone, but the biggest message about Steve Jobs was about simplicity. Going back to what Mario said, he was a person full of humility in that respect. And if you look at his products, they are simple products. The simplicity of the Apple products is really what is so different. He was obsessed with the idea that through simplicity, 
we can create beautiful products that can change the world. And I think, you know, that goes back also to a lot of what Mario said earlier in terms of finding resources from within, having faith in ourselves, not complicating the message, keeping it focused. Don't live someone else's life. Live your own life. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, now, now I'd like to go to Professor Mario's uh, metaphor about what the, the middle um, century person was, was building. Was he building a wall? Was he building a church? Or was he uh, building a monument to God? In Spain, uh, it, it is very famous that uh, you have, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct, but uh, Sasra de Familia? The Sagrada Familia. Sagrada, no, Sagrada yeah. Familia, uh, made by uh, Gaudi. Gaudi. Mm -hmm. uh, how would that monument or sculpture or, uh, appeal to you? Because yeah. I, I think Gaudi knew that it would not be finished <coughs> when he was alive. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a very, very good question. Gaudi knew that he was building an impossible monument. There's no monument like that in the world. And Gaudi knew that he wouldn't enjoy the monument, but for him, for him it was impossible that other people enjoy the monument. I mean, when we plant seeds of beauty and seeds of truth, Many of these seeds will grow into plants, but we will not see them. The beautiful thing is to know that other people will enjoy the beauty of those plants because we planted those seeds before. This is when we really uh, become a brotherhood, when we plant seeds thinking that they will benefit other, other people. Gaudi was one of these people. Very much. Uh, we all must go to Spain to, to see uh, Sar Saradia Famili Sagrada Familia Sarada, in, Bar in Barcelona, uh, yes. Famili Familia, and also yes. visit uh, IE Business School. Yeah. Well, important. IE Business School is in Madrid. And it's Ma in Madrid. Yeah. So we have to visit yeah. two towns uh, yes. in Spain. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, because of time, um, you at Globus, uh, we strive to build visionary leaders who create and innovate societies. And uh, I, I think there's many Japanese students here. There, there are many Asian students here. There are many international students here. What would be your piece of advice towards the students who came here today? May I have one word for, from both of you? I remember once, many years ago, um, I was looking at the window. I was looking through the window of my hospital. And I was, um, and I had been listening to a calling for some time. Because some of my patients told me, Mario, you got to share this content with other people. Do not restrict that to hospitals. And I was very resistant to that because I only saw myself as a surgeon. But a woman told me in such a way that I decided to pay attention. And then I had to take a, a, a great leap. And I felt the vertigo and I felt the dizziness. And I was looking through that window. And that was a quiet afternoon at the hospital. And I decided to reflect if I should take that step forward or not. Because for a surgeon, it's very difficult to go back, to return. And I will tell you something. When you listen to that voice, when you pay attention to that inner voice, not the ego voice, the voice of the master, and you take a step forward, you will always succeed. You know, now I am in Tokyo. I'm so fortunate of being here. Because one day I look through that window and say, what do I truly want in my life to make a difference at this stage of my life? And I felt all the fear at that moment. I also felt the faith and the passion. I have a little strategy. I didn't know if I would survive economically. 
I tell you something. What happened afterwards cannot be described um, in normal terms. It's as, it's as if the whole universe helped you to achieve your dream. I know it sounds strange, but it is the way I experience it. So I cannot give myself any merit. And then I started to do a lot of marketing. No, 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 no. In some way, when you align yourself with your inner voice, you become a magnet. And you start to attract from the universe. You know, you start coming across people that want to help you, and you know why. So it's about, as Paris said, we need to spend some time reflecting. We are going too fast. And we might end ending in a place that we didn't want to go. So take time to reflect upon what truly inspires you, what really touches your heart, what moves you. And when you find it, my proposal, from my experience, is the only thing that I have to share with you. Follow that. You will succeed for sure. I want to give you a piece of advice which is difficult advice because it's also an issue not just here in Japan but in most of the world, especially in Europe. One of the basic problems that we face as leaders or as future leaders is our relationship with professional failure. See, in most of the world, Professional failure equals personal failure. In Spain, for example, I struggle with this every day. I try to teach my students that to fail professionally is actually to learn. In America, failure professionally is learning. In Silicon Valley, actually, when they're interviewing people, they don't like people that only have succeeded. Because when they see someone that's failed several times, they know they've learned. Now, in Japan, this is a serious problem. Because you've been brought up in such a way where when you fail professionally, you probably look for the open window. And that has to stop. Now, how can you stop that while not losing your personal identity. What makes you also strong? Because that sense of responsibility, of not accepting failure, also has a positive side. And that's what's made you great. Your sensitivity, your attention to detail, your professionalism. So that's the challenge. How can Japan embrace the things it needs to embrace, because the world has changed. The business models are changing. Unless you start to accept professional failure and the society accepts it as part of learning, you're going to have problems in having people become entrepreneurs. You're going to have problems in having people grow professionally. You have to open your mind much more you have to learn through mistakes, because that's the only way you learn. While at the same time, you have to keep the beautiful things of this country, which is your discipline, your sensitivity, your attention to detail. My wife and I were here a few years ago for two weeks. And believe me, we had trouble going back to the West. I got on the Lufthansa flight, and I was standing in the corridor, and this big German woman kicked me almost. And I thought I was surrounded by cattle. And I said to myself, I miss Japan. I want to go back. So that's my advice. Take the good things from the West, especially the idea that we make mistakes and there's nothing wrong with that. We should learn from that. 
But as I said at the beginning of my talk, the reality is changing. The world is much less predictable. And your neighbors are learning very quickly. So we have a sense of urgency here. Don't settle.